Gas masks and hand grenades. <laughs> Hey, 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 what is happening? YouTube, it's uh, Gas Mask and Hand Grenades back again for the second time today. You got to see me earlier when we did the uh, the live uh, hang with the Medusa's Discos dudes, but we're back again. I'm your host, Jeff, by the way. We're back again tonight because, I'm not going to lie, man, I've had some killer guests on this show, but there might not be a guest that I've been more stoked about talking to than my guest today you see got to tell a little story here 1988 i was constantly on the hunt for new progressive metal bands having just discovered bands like queen's the ep and the warning and fate's warning awaken the guardian and fifth angel's first album and that was from like the 84 to 86 time frame and all of a sudden this release comes out and i believe i was racking my brains for the last week trying to remember like how i found out about this band and i either read about them in kerrang or i believe what might have happened is i might have seen on headbangers ball i might have seen the video for the single from this 1988 album lonely and the album is of course transcendence the band crimson glory and i gotta say man to me this is a top three album of my lifetime it is that fucking killer and we're gonna talk to the original founding member guitarist backing vocalist songwriter the whole nine yards we're gonna bring this guy in here because i'm stoked to talk to him mr ben jackson ben what's up man what's up how are you i'm good i'm gonna toast you sir with a uh, a little blueberry shandy here Blue awesome. Trail, that's, that's a local yeah. brew. So, sir, I um, a little backstory real quick, and then we'll get into this thing. Um, as I mentioned, Kelly and I are buddies. Kelly Schaefer, and you know Kelly, I believe, pretty well. Yeah, um, well he's what's buddies. that? We're buddies, too. Yeah, yeah. Great, great, great human being, man. Just such a yeah, awesome yeah, for, fucking guy. And no um, so... About a year ago, when I did that episode that we were talking about before we went live here of Forgotten Metal Gems, where we talk about all the albums with Astronomica, because at that point that wasn't in the, that was past the 90s. So we were only doing 80s and 90s albums. Um, I, I, I was talking to Kelly one night. I said, dude, do you know the Crimson Glory dudes by chance? I mean, they're like right there in Sarasota, like, right? And he's like, do I know them? He's like, fuck, dude. They, we practiced three doors down from him. And he's like, yeah. we used to go over there. We were like the little kids and they were like the grown up dudes. And we'd go over and watch them practice. They had a PA and they were like putting on like full fucking concerts. Like when we're like little nerds, just jamming in the, you know, in the garage watching these guys. Right. And I said, Wonderful. well, can you hook me up with any of the guys? I want to go back and do an interview, a retro interview about the band. He's like, yeah, I, I worked with Jeff and we used to work at a oyster bar or something like that. I'll let me get let me let me talk to him and I'll say something to you. And Jeff reached out to me and via email and he's like, Hey, Kelly said you were interested in talking. And we had a couple emails back and forth and then nothing. It just it never happened. Not, oh. not I'm not dissing Jeff or anything. I just I know his mom got sick and I know that was probably something that kind of was he's had a lot. With her and, and yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, that it didn't happen, and I kind of gave up until a couple weeks ago. I started thinking, wait a minute, There's, you know, when the when the news broke in December that you guys were back or coming back, okay, I'm like, uh huh, okay, well now, hey Kelly, hey, what's going on, man? Hey, by the way, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, who would you suggest I reach out to? He's like, dude, reach out to Ben. Ben's fucking cool. You guys will get along really well. Check, you know, check in with him, and and now here you are, man. So, 
thank you so much for that, brother, for, for stopping by tonight. So pleasure, man. Awesome. Before we yeah, before we jump into Crimson Glory and the backstory and what's going on in the present and the future, um, I kind of want to learn a little about a bit about you, Ben Jackson. Um, you're a couple years older than me. I'm 57, almost 58. And so you're like what, two, three years older than me, something in that range? 60, yeah. 60, yeah. So we kind of grew up in the same time era and the same era of music and, and all that kind of stuff. Probably had similar upbringings. You, are you a Florida guy originally, always born and bred? Um, you know, I was raised in Florida from the age of seven. I was born in Ohio. Oh, okay. Ohio. My family, yeah, my family moved down to Florida when I was seven years old. So I feel like uh, pretty Florida. much a Florida boy. Yeah. Um, and so I guess what I wanted to ask you about was I always ask this of my guests, what was the first quintessential moment that you heard music that you're like, Oh man, something clicked, something resonated. That you were like, wow, that's like, that really affected me. I want more of that. Right. Um, do you remember what that was? And maybe like what your first couple of bands and, and, albums were that really turned you to maybe moving into the direction that you ended up going as an adult? Yeah, for sure. You know, I have to say the Beatles, like so many would say, but when I was young, they were really, you know, a big phenomenon. Everybody was, was into them and I discovered them fairly young and I think got my hands on one or two of their albums for, you know, my, my parents might have given them to me for birthday presents when I was young, and I, I love that stuff. Right. Also, like, uh, I wanted I wanted to play drums when I was really young, and I remember uh, having that album by Iron Butterfly, the song In Agata De Vida. In Agata De Vida, yeah. <laughs> Got a cool like, drum solo on it. A so I was an eighteen minute drum solo, right? I was interested in that band and that song just just because the drum thing that was going on, and yeah. So the these are a couple of things I remember from my earliest attractions to music is the Beatles. Um, you know, do you remember going on any like family trips or maybe, I don't know, like adventures or something with the parents and just like a, a, a specific song might jump out at you or something like that. Like, cause you know, we're seventies boys for the most part. Right. And oh, yeah. man, That's I remember. Rough. Go ahead. Yeah. One well, one time after we moved down from Ohio to Florida, we lived in Florida for a few years, and I think I was getting to be in my early teens, and my dad and my brother and I took a trip back to Ohio to visit some family up there, but we didn't take my sisters or my mom on that trip. It was just my dad, my dad, my brother, and myself, the three nice. guys. And my brother had this cool GTO and eight-track tape in his car with uh, Leonard Skinner's first album. Oh, yeah. And we popped it in, and we're listening to Free Bird on the way up there, you know? And I was, like, mesmerized by this song, by this band. You know, I was just like, wow. Is that, before you, is that before you started playing guitar? Yeah, I hadn't. I wasn't playing guitar yet, but I was right. just, you know, just discovering rock and roll through my brother because he was about four years older than I was. And okay. He had the cool cars, and he had the eight-track tapes in his car, and he had Zeppelin four in the car and ah. you know, Leonard Skinner's first album. He had Jethro Tull's Aqualung in the car. Oh, and, absolutely. You know, yeah. Every time I'm riding around with him. He's playing these eight track tapes and I'm just like, wow, this stuff is beyond cool. You know, you had like yeah. bad. So that's kind of where I just really developed a love for rock. And music. Yeah, dude, that, that first bad company album and burning sky, man. Burning Sky was so killer, man. That track itself. It was in the first two albums by Bad Company. I love those when I was yeah. a kid. I, I, I heard you. I heard you talk about Frampton Comes Alive on a different interview, and of course, yeah, I huge, like that. huge, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I was young, I really, really enjoyed that stuff. All yeah, that seventy guitar hero shit, right? For like Frampton Comes Alive, Frank Marino Live. Do you remember that one? Yeah, I do. Rush. I saw him uh, when I was very young. I got a chance to see Aerosmith, who I was a big fan of Aerosmith. And I saw them around the time of the Draw the Line album. Oh. And Frank, Frank Marino was the opening band. No and, uh, way. 
that. I was a pretty young kid then, and just I'll always remember that show. It was awesome. Frank that'd be Marino. Right, that'd be right around the live album, 77, 78, probably, right? Probably, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Did I think I heard you say that Frampton was your first concert, though, right? Yeah. And it was for was. that album? Yeah, for the Frampton Comes Alive tour. Wow. Did you go by yourself or with your brother or with your parents? Or? A friend of mine from school and his, his older sister took us up to the show. And um, just, uh, I think my friend and I were around 13. His sister was a little older, yeah. like late teens, 17 or so. And she drove us up. Nice. It was uh, definitely memorable. I'll never forget that. Did Did you like a lot of other 70s kids? I got to mention the name, man, because this was the band that dragged me in, Kiss. Yeah, you know, I liked Kiss when I was young, too. I wasn't like a huge fanatic, but I liked them. I had uh, the Kiss Alive 2 album when I was a very young kid. Yeah. And I was pretty into that album for, for a little bit. And I uh, didn't really pursue and get their whole catalog. I had some, I had some friends, still have a friend. Uh, my friend Ryan, who's just loves Kiss, he's fanatic about them. Well, that was my first show, 1979 Dynasty tour. Uh, I was, uh, I was 14, 13 or 14, and then, but then the thing with that with Kiss was, I just, you know, I kind of discovered it at Kiss Alive, grabbed that out, and then got Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun Destroyer and stuff like that, Dress to Kill. But by the time Dynasty came out, I kind of I discovered Rush, man, and it was over. I was like, "Fuck that, man! I want this. That's what I want. I want Rush." Understandably, the the music's up there, another level, right? Hell yeah, man! Hemispheres, my favorite album of all time. Not even close. Crimson Glory's close, but it's not Hemispheres. I'm sorry, it just. Not. <laughs> I think you understand. I love that album too. When I was young. Yeah. I used to have. I play that in my car. I had that on a cassette. Hemispheres. Yeah. I drive, play it all the time. It it's funny, man. You yeah. think back, Jeff, to when we were, you know, in our late teens, and the A track was the thing. That was the way that you could listen to music in the car, right? And they were so shitty, man, because they they get to the end and then they'd sometimes like grind up and not flip over, and they were warbly and yeah. shit. You'd have to pull it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. funny now with like CDs and shit beyond that. Now we're at, you know, streaming stuff with you using a, your phone and stuff. It's crazy. But, um, so <laughs> what's that? Things have changed. You're, you're making me feel old. Well, I'm right there with you, brother. You're not that much beyond me. Right. You know, um, uh, when did you good. take up a guitar? Uh, I think when, yeah, I was around 13, I think. Yeah, when I was 10, I really wanted to play drums, and I kind of had my head on that for a couple years there. But around the time I was 13, I changed, wanted to play guitar. So uh, my have, dad. Like, was your dad player? I had a friend who gave me a guitar because he knew I had an interest in it. So his name was Cliff, and I started playing this guitar. Um, my dad uh, was a piano player. So oh, the musical okay. in the household came from him. He was a really good piano player. Um, did what, did you take lessons, or did you just kind of learn by listening to records? Or yeah, I took a few lessons. You know, when I was very young, my parents took me down to a shop in Sarasota, Florida, called Jules Music, and had a few lessons from a guy there, and he got me started. And but it really came down to just uh, once I started hanging out with some local friends from junior high school. And, and you know, we, we had a similar interest in wanting to play rock songs and learn. We show each other songs and teach each other things. Right. It just kind of came from a lot of it self-taught and just things that I'd pick up from friends that I was playing with. Yeah. I mean, when I was, I started playing when I, I got my first guitar at eight. But I didn't really start playing seriously until I was a little, like 15, 14 maybe. But I did the Mel Bay primer, you know, with the book, with the trying to read music. And I can, but not very slow. Like I, I could never sight read or anything like that. So I just, 
I play by most of it is developing your ear, and that's the best way to do it, man. You know, when you hear those notes, you know where to go, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, let's see. I'm just trying to trying to check my. I, I'm old, so I got to check my little uh, my little schedule and stuff here. Um, how about uh, what was your first band? Did you have a band in like like high school or junior high or anything like that? Yeah, my first band. I, I've been asked this a couple times, but the name of the band was called Pierced Arrow. Oh, so it and, was uh, the pre Crimson Glory band then? Well, yeah, it was. It was the band that Dana and I started together when we were fifteen year olds. Okay. Um, our, our first band. We were with some high school friends. A guy named Bernardo Hernandez was the other guitar player, and we played with him for a few years. And and uh, he he came up with the name Pierced Arrow. And uh, he also knew through high school, he knew Jeff Lords and and uh, introduced Dana and I to Jeff. So uh, this is the connection, you know, that, that began when we were all pretty young teens in high school. And you all went to the same school? Uh, Dana and I went, went to Sarasota High or Sarasota Junior High. I think Bernardo did too. Jeff, I think he might have went to – Brookside or Riverview, I'm not sure, but, but somewhere and, close by. Yeah, close by. Yeah, is uh is Florida like like I lived in Houston, Texas for a while, and they it's a little different than up north here. They they kind of have subdivisions, and then they have schools for the subdivision. Was it, was it kind of like that for Florida or? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um. And Sarasota, like that's is that a pretty big town? Like you're not that's below Tampa by a bit, right? Yeah, it's about an hour south of Tampa, you know, forty five minutes south of St. Petersburg. Right. And then where's Bradenton? Is that in that same area or is that is that north? Right above Sarasota, kind of the next connecting city. Okay, so it's the next one then. Okay, cool. Um yeah, right now so, I'm in so Pierce Darrow is the first incarnation of what becomes Crimson Glory. Um, and you guys were just doing covers, right? For the most part, just learning covers. Yeah. Did you play out anywhere or do like a school talent show yeah. or battle of the bands? Exactly. We would do like a battle of the bands or something. Actually, we did one at our high school, Sarasota High School, one year. And there were like five or six other bands involved in the, in the gymnasium there. And, and we won the, the the vote that night as best band. It was kind of cool. Yeah. And this was Dana and I and the band Pierce Darrow. And our original singer's name was Tony Wise. So that was uh, something I still remember as being kind of fun. And what grade and were you in? Do you remember? Besides the Battle of the Bands, we would play, you know, we would play people's backyard parties. Keggers. You know, some, somebody, keggers, somebody would get a keg on the weekend yeah. and, We'd like set up in the garage and just like play and all the people would be standing at the opening of the garage or out into the yard and kind of how we, we got things uh, started. That's more yeah. of a Southern thing, man. I mean, fun times. Yeah. Did, um, and you probably weren't legal to drink yet. Right. But it was probably 18 down there. Right. Yeah. When I was a kid, uh, I, you had to be 18 to drink. But you, and you didn't drink, of course, when you were underage, right. <laughs> No, we, we would all buy, you know, we would all chip in and buy the cheapest beer we could get so we could drink a lot of it. Natty <laughs> Bow, Natty Bow, or some shit like that, right? Old Milwaukee. Weird beer, you know, and we yeah. would just, yeah, we would practice. But when the band would practice, when, you know, we wouldn't really drink too much while we practiced because we like to practice and, and try to better ourselves and be pretty serious. But yeah, when the, over we'd hang out for the rest of the evening and drink cheap beer and play games and stuff nice um did um when so you did that for a couple years then or and then and then what was the what was the thinking behind the change of the name to beowulf what was the thought process there we had a, a, the our one early guitar player bernardo ended up leaving the band and we had another guy come in and play with dana and i and his name was chris and he suggested the name Beowulf, and we thought it was pretty cool. So, you know, like a lot of young bands, you don't always ride with the same name forever. You you change the band name a couple times while you're going through the growing pains of being a young player, you know? Sure. 
we and, started, and it, yeah, we call it Beowulf, and we did that for a few years. Was uh, just just out of curiosity, do you remember a band named Marillion? Yeah, I did. The neo prog band from uh, England. They they wrote a song called in 1983, I believe, or 80, 82, maybe it was, or 81. They had a song called Grendel, which was the the monster, I believe, or the hero. I forget what. No, Beowulf was the hero in the story, and Grendel was the monster. Yeah, yeah. I, think I right. wondered if maybe that was something you thought about. Not, not probably the reason, right? Uh, you know, we were young, and I we kind of knew a little bit about the story when our guy, when our guitar player suggested the name Beowulf. I think we were even maybe working on a song with Grendel in the title back then, but uh, I don't know if it ever came. Well, it would have been probably 11th grade that's when you read that 10th or 11th grade your english people your english lit that's part of your deal right so probably a yeah. little bit of a seed was planted there yeah for him coming up with um, the name so let's see here um speak to me a little bit about the okay so you do the beowulf thing you're still doing covers right or were you starting to write originals well, in the Beowulf thing, we were still doing covers, but not so much the uh, classic 70s rock covers like in Pierced Arrow, but we were starting to do more like Accept and Iron okay. Maid and kind of getting it a little more into the 80s metal and stuff. We're doing a lot of Judas Priest songs. And and uh, also, we did start to write a couple songs at that point, too, when we were Beowulf. We, we tried our hand at writing a couple songs. and went into a couple of local studios and recorded a couple of those. So you, you kind of moved into the new wave of British heavy metal influence then? Yeah, I think so a little bit. And, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, after a while of doing that, there was just kind of a decision made one day where we said, let's just do all originals. You know, we're, we're not going to get anywhere, you know, playing out the, the rock bars, like some of our friends and just playing covers. There's, not that much satisfaction in that. So we wanted to take it to the level of being an all original band. And at that point, I guess you're thinking with originals, you have the, you have the potential to sign a, a recording contract or maybe to go more professional as opposed to being a bar band. Right. Yeah, of course. That was the thought. Um, so I guess where I wanted to go with that was, what was the what was the scene like in Tampa and Sarasota as far as because now this is this is a little bit pre the death metal thing that doesn't kind of kick in until 85, 86, 87, more 86, 87 with death and obituary and stuff like executioner. But what's going on in that area? You got nasty savage, right? You got sabotage. Yeah, what, for sure. What what's your perception of what's happening? Or and and how involved are you and Dana and the other guys in that local metal scene at that point? Well, you know, we, we became pretty recognized. We put out the first Crimson Glory album. Luckily enough, um, we were picked up by the Par Records label that also worked with Sabotage on their first album, mm -hmm. Siren. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, but before we put out our first album, we were a band that was just kind of hungry and trying to, write songs that we thought would would get us noticed you know and uh so but we did see a little bit about what we were kind of watching what they were doing a little bit sabotage and uh because they 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 broke out a little bit ahead of us maybe a year or two ahead with their album before we came out with our first right but, but we, we were kind of lucky that when our first album did come out uh, we got a bit of recognition in Europe with a lot of the, the metal magazines and and uh, the, the record got a lot of praise. So we were sort of pretty uh, instantly um, embraced. Embraced, yes. How? OK, so before we jump into the first album, which I'm almost there, um, how like you it's you guys and there's a couple other dudes that then kind of move out and. How does Midnight and Drenning become part of the equation? Like, what's the backstory behind those two additions to the band? Oh, how did they come in? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, 
I think Dana and I, you know, started out pretty young and oh, something came up in my screen that blocked you out. Just a sec. I'm here. I can see you. So Dana and I had this band going for a while, Pierce Darrow, then Beowulf and the guitar player named Chris that came into Beowulf. At one point, I think Dana and I became maybe bored with what he was bringing to the, to the formula. And, uh, and the, in the warehouse where we used to rehearse, several different rooms were there on each side of the hallway where different people would rehearse. And one day, Dana and I heard this guy playing guitar on the other side of the hall coming from a, behind a closed door. And the guy was just wailing out like Randy Rhodes riffs and songs oh, like Weaver and stuff. And it was just like we were like, well, whoever's playing in there is really like something else. And, and it turned out to be John Drenning. So. And uh, Dana and I probably, we were like 18 back then, had our band going for a couple of years, few years. And we met John that day and he was 16, a couple years younger mm -hmm. than us. And, uh, we, you know, we invited him to come across the hall and jam with us because he didn't really have a full band. He was, you know, jamming in a room, maybe with a bass player. They were trying to start a band. We said, John, you know, we have a band. We have a, a full band, you know, come over and play guitar with us. So he did. Um, we played with John, Dana and I, and maybe another singer, another bass player for a little a while. And you know how people tend to come and go from projects. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I think the, the bass player ended up going and we brought Jeff in and then he was playing with us for a while with John and Dana and I with, with another singer named Mark. He ended up going and leaving the picture and we, we needed a new singer. So um, we basically at that point had all the musicians in place that was Crimson Glory. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were looking for the right singer for the band. Um, and then we just discovered Midnight because he was a local guy who went to high school with Dana and I, he used to date Dana's sister. And oh, no way. Kind of, yeah, he, and he was just, uh, he wasn't known as being a rock singer, uh, but more like being like a, a folk singer, a guy that would just play his acoustic at people's pool parties and just yeah, play like the mellower side of Zeppelin stuff, like going to California and some really cool Pink Floyd songs. And we all knew him from around high school as being that guy that he, he had a really good voice and he'd grab an acoustic guitar and entertain you all night just by himself. Right. But something, something one day, I think Dana's sister, Darlene said, why don't you guys give Midnight a try or give him an audition? And we thought, that, like, that did guy? He have, like, that did, guy? Yeah, he's got a good voice, but he's probably not a metal singer. You know, we're looking for a, a metal singer. <laughs> yeah. We brought him out to our, our rehearsal place and tried him out. Yeah, we knew right away, he, you know, he could do something, you know, with this. He was Mind very, capable, very capable, very talented, special. Did he have the name? Did he have that nickname Midnight at that point or not? Yeah, he did. Yeah. When, did he? Do you, do you know where that came from? Do you have any idea? Yeah, he used to tell this story about um, when he was younger. He, I think he lived in California. So, uh, I, I don't know if this is exactly right, but he said something like he was living, camping in the mountains or something, ended up meeting this girl out there made some sort of a connection with, and she gave him this nickname, Midnight. Ah. And then he, right after the, he, she gave him, named him that, like she um, met her demise, like drove over a, a cliff or something and ended up dying. <laughs> oh, and shit. He, and he always kept the name. And, and um, he, I remember him telling the story quite a few times. I've even remember him saying it in interviews. So. Uh, wow. That's, I had never heard that. That's pretty wild. Um, he was a pretty dramatic guy, though, right? He's pretty. He explained it in his own special way, but that's the gist of it, you know, yeah. that I remember. Yeah. And so he comes in and, and does an audition for you guys, and you guys are all, are you all looking at each other with that look in your eye, like, holy fuck? Like. Yeah, because he yeah. had a great voice, you know, a great tone and, and power and, and presence. And, I think we, we gave him a list of songs to learn, like, that we like to play. We're like, here, can you learn Diamonds and Rust by Judas Priest? And can you learn, like, uh, we do 20th Century Man by the Scorpions? And we're, oh, yeah. doing, like, we're doing 
doing a couple accept songs and we gave him like six songs as learn these and come out and sing them with us. And he came out and it was really not like up his alley of what he used to do, but he did it really well. We're like, Whoa, listen to this guy. You know, he's really good. Wow. That's, that's, that's amazing. So what year was that? Do you remember what year? The- we sorry, go ahead. Metal- I'm sorry to talk over you. We sort of made a metal singer out of a folk singer is kind of what we did. <laughs> That's an interesting story. Just so you know, there's a little bit of a delay on your end. So I'll try yeah. to stop. I, when I see you start to move your lips. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. Um, so what year was that when he came in? Um, hmm. 84? Oh, no, more like 80, 83 or 4, yeah. Okay, so it was, it was, but it was well in advance of the first album. You guys all then started writing the album? Yeah. I wanted to ask you, and, and maybe this, it, maybe it's not a question you want to answer, but when Drenny came into the band, did you sort of defer to him writing so much, or was it just that he was that good of a songwriter that, like, everybody kind of leaned on? Because he did write a lot of the material. I mean, you guys all did, but I guess Midnight wrote a lot of the lyrics, right? And then, but did was was Drenny just that? alpha writer or what was the story there yeah i guess you could say it like that you know he had he had the personality and he was always like check this out check this out you know go 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 very eager you know and yeah and uh, he had a lot of he had a lot of riffs and ideas and he was always throwing them out there so so he ended up being you know a strong part of the, the writing of the early stuff for sure jeff as well i mean jeff doesn't get the credit he deserves he's kind of a the quiet guy but but he wrote a lot of a lot of the riffs in parts and um and things that went into the first couple albums as well musically. A lot Was of it Jeff- came from Jeff and John and, and uh Dana and I contributed uh, as much as we could, you know, with uh sometimes strong personalities that are was was Jeff um was Jeff a primarily a guitar player first and became a bass player, or was he a bass player that could play guitar? No, Jeff was always a, a bass player. Okay. But he thought so, of this like a guitarist with riffs. Well, you know, he plays really good guitar, too. I mean, he's a really strong rhythm guitar player and writes a lot of cool rhythm guitar parts. But, you know, his instrument is bass. That's what he, you know, loves to play. That's what he shines at. That's his instrument. Yeah, and he, but, plays, he plays Spectres. Love yeah. Spectres. I just bought a Spectre not too long ago. So love that yeah, fucking thing. Um, like it yeah um how did you guys get the deal with uh with um hold on one sec oh was the were you starting before the album were you actually playing out locally as crimson oh no no um we uh when we were beowulf you know we we played a few clubs here and there and local clubs because there was a little bit more of a scene back then than there is now as far as cl- right. clubs. So, you know, even Pierre Stereo, like I explained before, we just played like high school battles of the bands, maybe a couple backyard parties. When, right. when it was cool, we would play out some local nightclubs and we were getting to be drinking age by then. So we, we would do that a little bit. But before we got too far into doing that, we made that decision to just be an original band. So then the idea of playing out was out of the question. We weren't, you know, we weren't playing out. Okay. That's what I was curious about. So you didn't really play out as Crimson Glory until after the first album came out? Yeah. Wow. No shit. How about that, man? That's interesting. You never played one show out as Crimson Glory until the album came out. And you adopt the face mask thing. And what was this? What's the, the long and short of that? What was that? all about like in terms of just being theatrical and kind of giving you a different look yeah exactly just uh it was an idea that popped into the heads of uh one day uh, our manager and john drenning were together and they were coming down from tampa to pick me up for a photo shoot we planned that day and just they they came into my apartment and they had this this mask with Stopped and picked up at a costume shop along the way, and they said, "Hey, we got this idea for today's photo shoot. We're gonna do this, and 
I'm kind of like, uh, oh, uh, you know, it just kind of grew. It was like, I don't know if it was Warren's idea or John's or both of them that day, but. Was uh, Warren your manager? Yeah. Warren was our manager at the time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, good. Uh, Warren used to be very, I think he was friends with Bill O'Coin, the guy that used to manage Kiss back Kiss, in the day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah friendship with him and maybe uh maybe that had something to do with why he had this idea of masking us you know to make yeah, us could uh, have been, yeah. uh, was he a local guy sarasota guy he lived in tampa at the time okay and was he a, like was he a professional guy did you seek him out or did he seek you out he was kind of professional at, at like taking bands money yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they all though? Isn't that that's the job of a manager? Stealing the money, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and he, good. He was good at it for sure. <laughs> I guess he's long gone in the rear view mirror, right? Yeah, as far as you know, any relationship with us, but yeah. um, I'm sure he's out there in the world doing something. <laughs> <laughs> um so How'd the deal with Par come together? And then were you guys literally doing the recording demos and sending them out or, or like what yeah, happened? We were recording a, a demo, you know, at Morris Sound Studio in Tampa back then. I think it was a five song demo that we went in and budgeted with, with some help from, I think even John's mom put up some wow. money to help board and, and, uh, while, while we were in Morris Sound, we met Dan Johnson because he was kind of in and out of there working with Sabotage, and and he knew Jim Morris, and Jim was working with us on our demo. So we just somehow got introduced to Dan from Par Records, and he took an interest in us. So we didn't really have to shop shop ourselves or anything. It just kind of developed that way. Just fell in your lap kind of to, to go from there, yeah. yeah. Was, is he the guy that produced it? Um, not the demo, but yeah, after he heard the five song demo we made, the album. we struck up a deal with him and then he did produce the first album. Yeah. The, the self-titled album. And you did that at Morris Sounds, right? Yeah, we did it at Morris Sound. Dan um, Johnson. Now that was 86, correct? That came yeah, out? Yeah. It came out October of 86. Yeah. When did you record it? Do you remember when you record? Was it 85 or early 86? 84 and 85, probably. We worked on it different songs over different months. Oh, okay. Over. So, yeah, yeah honestly, we didn't, we didn't just go in and do it all in a, in a month. I think some of the sessions were a bit spread out from what I remember. Um, more, more sound changed locations and built a new studio and we did some of the album in their their early location and we finished the record up in their newer studio and that was probably pre the death metal blow up right a little bit yeah yeah because later when you did transcendence the next album there was probably more overlap of that style of you know the the, the chucks and kelly's and you know the the um uh, the, tardies, more- the tardies yeah when Morrison was in the second location, I think they the death metal thing really started taking off. Were you uh, a fan of the death metal thing? Were you tied into it at all? Or were you kind of like on the outside looking in on that? Not that much, yeah. Kind of a little outside looking in. Just uh, um, seemed to have friends that, you know, were part of the local circle that were death metal guys, but not so much. Into the music. Not that much, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you like it now at all, or is it still not your thing? Not really, no. That's interesting. Not that's, much. I mean, I'm, that's cool to hear. I, I like, I like to hear that. You're, because I like do, I do like a lot of death metal, and I really love some of the Flor- Florida death metal. Maybe I haven't listened to enough of it, given it a chance. I'm not saying it's not awesome. I just, you know, kind of living in living under a rock you know i just kind of work a lot and uh you know i hear you i hear you i was just curious because it's interesting because 
you're from that scene, you're from that area, and it's right there around you. And you're like, and, and I mean, I imagine there's a lot of people who are like, don't even know that that. More into like power metal or melodic. Yeah. Metal and well, just... I was going to ask you, what were the influences for you and Dana and Jeff? What kind of bands were you listening to that started to form, and John too, that started to form the, the nucleus of what you wanted Crimson Glory to sound like? Of course, we all we all liked and listened to a lot of the '70s rock when we were younger, like everything from Aerosmith and Ted Nugent and AC/DC and and John and Jeff and I probably all had our share of all this. Like we like Queen and Boston and all, and I think it all might have played a little bit into the stylings that came across through us in the first Crimson Glory album, but but maybe more some of the 80s stuff that was out like right at the time that we were writing the first album might have been like Dio's Holy Diver album. Oh yeah. John and I and we really liked that a lot and um cuz it about, was out What about the Queen's Right EP or or maybe the Warning? Yeah, um yeah, when the first EP came out, you know, we were digging that and stuff. Um I think we may have already had a lot of our material written for our first album by the time I even ever heard that. So I'm not saying they were really an influence on us, but but I first time I heard them, I, I really dug them. But I think Iron Maiden and Judas Priest oh, yeah. and Dio were, were really probably a lot of the primary influences. A little bit of were, Rainbow? A little bit of Rainbow? That was the stuff that maybe were, was really influencing us at the time that we were writing that first album. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you do the first album. Uh, it's you know it's a killer album, obviously. Uh, what do you go out and start to then tour? Do they Roadrunner? How did Roadrunner and Road Racer get involved? Did they buy out the Par thing or how that? Par Par had a part. You know they had a deal pre-existing with Roadrunner in Europe where, you know, if they put out a record, it would be on par records in the United States and Roadrunner in Europe. So when we did our deal with par records, it was just an automatic that we would be on Roadrunner in Europe. And we kind of, you know, we learned, we learned this as things went along, you know? Yeah. Was, and uh, was, then we went up and played our first series of shows over in, in Holland where the first few shows we played and, and we met the owner of Roadrunner Records over there, and he, you know, took us out to dinner and arranged a couple cool photo shoots for us. And so, you know, then we got to to meet, you know, the Roadrunner. And you guys are what, like twenty three, twenty four here? Yeah, we were probably twenty three ish when we went to Europe the first time. Was it and, like um, a major head trip that you're traveling overseas to play a rock yeah. show? Definitely not going to lie. Yeah. The first time we went to Europe, uh, we were, we were just playing a bunch of clubs that were booked for us to play in, in, in the Netherlands. And we were supposed to play this, the art shock festival. Yeah. Yeah. On our very first trip, that was the, the biggest gig we were going to play. But then, um, I think it was because, uh, the bassist of Metallica died that the, the festival was rescheduled for like, a half a year later or something. Oh, wow. And so when, when we were actually there, that first visit over, we were really looking forward to playing that festival. And um, we didn't actually get to play it. It got rescheduled. So, but we did get, we did go back like, you know, a half year later and play the festival. Was that your um, first big European festival? That was the first biggest one we played. Yeah. It was Art Shock Festival and uh, Metallica was the headliner. Um, Anthrax was on the bill. Other bands like uh, I don't remember all of them, but Leather Wolf was on it. Maybe, oh wow, uh, Leather Wolf, yeah. Uh, Rocket. And there was just uh, Crimson Glory was on the bill, and this was uh, in Holland. It was kind of the first big taste of a of a festival that we got, but it was pretty cool. Um, did you do any touring in the U.S. on the first album? No, not really. Um, we did like one show in Tampa where we opened up for Paul Deano's Battle Zone. Mm. Yeah, I remember them. 
Uh, and I that think was it. That, that was it. That might have been the very maybe the first Crimson Glory live show we played was in Tampa, I think, when we opened for Paul Diano. And then shortly right after that, we went to Europe and Holland and started playing some clubs over there. And then uh, we came home and, like I said, our first trip over to Europe was just a few weeks playing metal clubs. Mm -hmm. Then we came, we went back like a half a year later, and and then we uh, jumped on a tour with Anthrax. We were their, we were their support band for about three weeks over in Europe. Uh, and that, also, was a, that was a Celtic Frost, right? Celtic Frost, and and that was also when we got the chance to play the the festival with Metallica that was also during the same trip over. Oh, okay. All right. How was that tour? Was, were those guys cool to you? Yeah, they were cool from what I remember. You know, we were, uh, um, anthrax guys were kind of cool. Sometimes we'd see them during the day, you know, hanging around the, the streets or the, near the places we were staying or chilling out and, you know, we'd rap with them a little bit. And yeah. Only. For the most part, I don't know if they really, what they really thought about us and our music and our image, the mass thing, if they thought maybe we were a little uh, silly or different, you know? <laughs> Look at these cheesy guys with the masks on. Now, they never yeah. thought that because those guys are all KISS guys. They love they KISS. The, they were very New Yorker type guys, you know, and they had True. kind of a style. You know, they definitely weren't posers. They didn't, they didn't like dressing cool clothes or or wear any makeup or anything. They were just spandex. Yeah, that's true. If you guys were doing the spandex thing, I'm not wearing like football jerseys and surf shorts and, <laughs> yeah. and just like you know. And I, I I thought they were cool. I would watch them every night on the tour, and they'd be romping around the stage, just having a fucking time in their lives, just ripping out that. <laughs> I go, wow, these are. I wasn't that familiar with them. Yeah. Before. Oh, really? Before we joined on the tour with them, and I saw them, I'm like, okay, these they were really good live, you know, they were really like, oh, yeah, yeah. How was how was Tom G? Did you get to meet him or talk to him at all? Um, yeah, for sure. He was, uh, is he all right? Yeah, he was all right. He's, you know, maybe unusual kind of guy. You know? I think, his, I, I think, is he has an no aura way. thing, you know, he has he wants to project this thing, but I've I've heard he's actually yeah. cool. He's from Sweden or somewhere yeah. over there. Swiss, Swiss, Switzerland. Switzerland. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't remember what country he was from. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, he's cool. And at the played, time, I think, I think his drummer was an American. He was. But Mark, Mark St. Reed, I think, or Reed St. Mark. You got it right the second yeah. time. I cool. Reed St. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Cool guy. Nice guy, man. That was our first tour, Anthrax and Celtic Frost. Good I always, memories. It was fun. Good times. Did um, did you have like a road crew go with you and everything? Um, yeah, we took a couple friends from home. Like we took a guitar tech, maybe a drum tech, and a, a sound guy. We had three guys, like three of our closest friends that were working with us when oh, we nice. were young. When we were a young band in the warehouse and. They came along and just uh, helped out a lot. And we, you know, we have our stories and adventures. We were living cheap, you know, staying in hostels and, you know, just barely getting by on our daily per diems. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So I wanted to mention this. Kelly told me this story that he, he played at the rehearsal space you guys did too, I guess, a warehouse or something. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. He tells he tell me this story that uh well he told me too. He's like, first of all, one night midnight came down to Atheist's crib, you know, their practice space, and jammed Flight of Icarus with them. <laughs> yeah. I guess I guess midnight sang Flight of Icarus while the other dudes played because Kelly was playing guitar back then. And yeah. so he told me that story, and they said we were talking the other night, and and I can't I can't remember why I brought this up. Oh, he said that you guys had a full PA at your rehearsal spot and you got that. They would always come down as young kids and watch you guys practice. Cause you guys like were putting on like a real rock show. Cause you had a, a PA and I asked, I said, well, did, did were those guys like 
were they all working and making good money or was somebody's parents like ponying up money or what's the deal? Cause it had to be one of those. This, this is before you got signed. And he says, well, I don't know, but Drenny drove up in a Corvette one time. So I think they had money. That's what that was said. Well, we, we really didn't know. I mean, we were just, uh, after a few years of playing like teenagers, you know, we, Dana and I started when we were 15. Maybe by that time, you know, we were Crimson Glory. We were like 21-ish or two or, mm -hmm. you know, by you've been playing six or seven years and you don't have a few nice pieces of gear. I mean, you're doing something wrong. But, <laughs> but I mean, you know, I, I just had a couple decent guitars and maybe a decent Marshall stack back then or some stuff. And so did John. And and uh, we had a, a sound guy friend who was a close friend of ours named Randy. And the PA was really his. Oh. It wasn't anything like super massively expensive or anything. It was just things he put together, you know, over the yeah. years of things. He was our sound man, our local sound man for a bunch of years. And, um, you know, maybe one or two of the things in the PA pieces might have been mine or, or somebody's in the band, an amp or something. But most of it was all Randy's, you know. So nobody in the band had rich parents. Nobody in the band really had too extravagant of gear or anything. We guys all work in day jobs. We all work in day jobs. Day jobs, and we just, you know, we had a five-piece band, and Randy was like the sixth member of the band. He was our friend and our sound man, and he he had a pretty decent PA. You know, I guess the, the guys in the other warehouses were a little envious, but yeah, it was it wasn't anything too too outrageous. You know, okay. Well, he didn't say that. He just was saying that you guys were like the envy of everybody because you had this killer PA and sounded like you were like a full on rock gods, you know. You know, I, I appreciate that he, that he viewed it that way. I think it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that um does what it does. And did you ever like get a sense of like how well it sold or yet you, you to this day, do you ever have any, any idea how that? Not really. I, I think it sold a lot of copies because you know in the early when it came out it was quite popular it got really great reviews in the, the metal mags in europe and i think it sold pretty good and, and there's been so many reissues over the years yeah where that might be hey they're they're putting out another limited edition of the album and silver vinyl or this that i'm not always like knowing really who, who's behind that or what's really going on so as far as an accurate count of how it sold, I don't really have that, but I, I think it sold pretty pretty good. Well, who owns uh, who owns the songs? Like, who owns the? Somebody owns the masters, right? Um, do you have any idea? Well, you know, things change after a, a 30, 35 year uh, time span of a career. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know if at the time when we signed with Par Records and Roadrunner, if if they actually own the masters or the band knows them. I don't really know. Now, I just tricky little question here, man. If you don't want to answer, it, you don't have to. But as far as publishing, did you guys did you guys kind of agree to a, a five way split, or was how that work out? Or don't you want to get into that? No, we we didn't have that kind of an agreement. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe John and Jeff and Midnight wanted to do a lot of the writing on the first couple of albums and just be like considered the the writers of the band, where Dana and I were more like players in the band, and mm -hmm. and Dana tried to in, inject interject some ideas and be part of the writing team, and you know, we ended up getting some writing credits on a couple songs like, you know, I think Dana's credited on red sharks and I'm credited on mask of the red death. And we're, mm -hmm. think the band was entirely every member credited on the, on the single dream dancer. But, you know, as far as publishing it, it's, it's not going to be a five way split unless the writing is exactly five way split because publishing is designed to go more, to the guys who are writing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I guess what I was getting at was like, for example, um, you know, Opeth, you know, the band Opeth. Yeah. So like Michael writes pretty much all the music almost exclusively. Right. And porcupine tree, Steve Wilson. 
I don't, do you know them? Yeah. Okay. So I, I did some work for them for a couple of years. And so I know them really well. And in the early days, Steve wrote all the music, basically demoed all the music. Guys would add their parts on, which is, I'm sure, what you guys did in the studio. But he split the publishing like equally with everybody, at least initially he did. I don't know what happened later, like as the band got more and more popular. I just was curious about that. Maybe, you know, I, I, maybe that's not something you want to get into, but I was just curious if, but you did kind of answer it. So, well, you know, yeah, it's not something that I really want to get into too much. It's just the way it was. I mean, you know, gotcha. and you know, none of us really ever saw too many accurate accountings to what our album was selling. Yeah. I think, I think there were secrets sometimes kept from, from the band that maybe the manager and even certain other members would, would know about, but the whole band wouldn't know about. So it, it really wasn't a band where, everybody wanted to share things equally. So no, okay. I got you. I got you. I, I see that, that kind of answers the question in a nutshell. So you, yeah, you no, then too far in any of that. I got you. Um, that's the only thing. I only have one other sticky question that you can defer when we get to the draining stuff in a minute about, about leaving. But, um, so you do transcendence and you're recording that. Is that another situation where you're recording that over a, several months or a year or so, or, Maybe a year. And you go back to Morrow Sounds, and this time Jim and uh, I forget the other guy's name, the brother. Tom. Tom. They're yeah. doing the actual production and engineering, right? Yeah. Was Scott Burns was working there at the time, wasn't he? Yeah, Scott was working there um, even when we were working on the first album. Uh, he was working at Morris Sound as an assistant engineer before he kind of like started doing a lot of the death metal albums as as like the main engineer and producer. And, right. And uh, his reputation started taking off. So you but, guys uh, weren't interested in bringing him on to do engineering? He, he did occasionally. I think he was in on a few sessions here and there where he was working as an assistant engineer for Jim or somebody. I mean, we, we already sort of... Uh, met Jim and and had a working relationship with him from from our early demo right and, and then even Tom we kind of worked with with Tom and by the time they brought Scott in we were already sort of you know working with the guys we were used to working with which was Jim and Tom so but I but we we met Scott when he came in and and he was a really cool guy and you know we all befriended him as well and he, and I remember him being around for some of our sessions as well, maybe helping out as an assistant engineer, having something to do with something on a certain day or another. So, um, were you writing? Well, you weren't. You weren't specifically writing, but I mean, like the band as a whole. Was everybody writing at home, or were they writing in the studio, or on the road, or do you remember any of that? You mean for the first album? No, Did? transcendence. Transcendence. Um, well, we did write a lot of stuff in the warehouse, you know, where we would practice. We were one of right. them kind of back when we were young, it, it wasn't unusual for us to be together practicing like three, four nights a week, you know, religiously. We we would be there all the time just playing, you know, and if anybody came in the room on a certain night with even a little piece of a song or an idea, we'd be like, hey, let's jam on this. Let's work on that. Yeah. So Midnight was the kind of guy back then that he'd always have a notebook and he'd like to be writing in his notebook. So he would he would write when he was home, you know, late at night, candles lit. You know, he'd be and writing he, something. He played you know. guitar, too. Right. So he was a guitar player as well. So he wrote a lot of stuff in his own time of solitude. And he'd come to us and say, hey, I have some song ideas and he'd show them to us. And we would turn him into more of a band. You know, col you know, collaborate. You know, John. Like I, we all know, John was was a very strong and eager writer back then. He was always throwing out ideas and riffs, and let let's work on this, guys. Let's work on this. You know, and mm -hmm. very hyper kind of guy. <laughs> okay, like, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jeff was all there with riffs, and 
uh, occasionally me too. Maybe I, I was a little more of a, a, a back personality or, or a quieter personality that was taking my time to, to really get into the, the feeling of, okay, I, I can write here too. But eventually that came and I started contributing more to writing as well. But, but a lot of the stuff we wrote, you know, I, yeah, we would all have ideas at home and we would bring them to each other and show them to each other in the rehearsal room and just, you know. So when it came it, time to do Transcendence, did you guys go into We had already played all the songs in the warehouse and could play them all pretty well, you know. Okay, so they were already well formatted. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when you went of, in there, there was a lot of it was get it done, right? Not when we recorded on you know our four track recorders we had back then, and that's kind of what all of us had in those days a little cassette four track yeah, the old four track Fostex, right? I had a Fostex, I think John had a Tascam, and we would just yeah. record all the songs. So most, most of the transcendent songs we had recorded one way or another on our old little four tracks, wow. but we could all. But we could also play them in the warehouse really pretty strongly and tightly before we even went to Morristown and started booking the sessions to record the album. We, we could already play that album like really, really well. So you were locked in pretty well. Yeah. So we went in to record it. Everybody had their parts pretty well worked out and rehearsed. So you get into Morristown. Are you... As you're tracking this thing, and, and that's all two-inch tape back then. That's analog. Um, yeah. What what was the – do you remember, like, any of the specs? How many channels? Like, 72? How many tracks did you have? No. They, they had, like, a 24-channel oh, board. And oh, it was only 24. Okay. Two-inch tape machine. Yeah. That's incredible. When you listen to this album, to realize that was done on a 24-channel a channel board is just insane because this album man ben is just one of those albums that the production is as much the star as the songs are because the songs are stellar and the performances are stellar but the production is just fucking huge dude it's just like it's epic and it's the epitome of epic to me right I'm not really sure what you know console they were actually moved up to at the point when we were working on transcendence i think they probably did have something bigger than 24 channel at that but that's what they had when we started demoing there on the first the first go around at morris island i think they had like a 24 channel and the and the analog tape machines but once once transcendence they had a sl ssl console in there yeah they still neve. use was it neve no solid state logic Oh, was SSL that? Yeah, the okay. Um, and, um, so I can't really remember exactly how many channels they were working with for Transcendence, but it wasn't. I can't remember if it. Was, I don't think it was seventy-two, but might maybe forty-eight or or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, did you guys, as you're recording this album, that was before? Get, I mean, it was analog, so right. But as you're going in there, and when, when a couple times back then, when Jim would have to like splice the tape if we wanted to make an edit, yeah, he'd be taking a razor blade to the tape. <laughs> that so shit's crazy. You know, I, was, yeah, I was watching this go on. I was learning. I was kind of like, wow, that's how you do that, huh? Yeah, you know? yeah. Are, are um, you actually, as you guys are getting, uh, not final mixes? What, what's that called when you're doing? I guess preliminary mixes of it, right? Um, are you guys as a group, are you guys all in there at the same time? Or are you kind of in and out at different times where you're not all together? Or And the reason I ask is I'm just wondering, like, as you're hearing playbacks of some of this shit, are you just going, holy fuck, man, like, listen to this? Yeah, yeah, we were. Um, especially on, you know, on those first two albums, like I say, because we were young guys and very – uh amped up enthusiastic about what we were doing together and yeah we would always all be there it seems like at the studio okay. yeah almost when every guy was recording seemed like the other guys would be around that day too you know listening in and checking it out and 
everybody was sort of paying attention to everybody else while they were doing their work. It wasn't like, okay, the guitar players are here today and the other guys didn't really come today. You, you know, like okay. it kind of is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, we might, we might have a guy like just do his parts on his day and another guy goes in on his day and does his parts. But back then when we were young, we were all like always there all the eager. time. You were eager to see what was going on. Right. For sure. That was the, the spirit back then. Now, now, the weird thing is, I did not know this until I heard you talk about this in a interview. Maybe it might have been with the Scottish guy. I forget his name. Friday the 13th or something like that. Uh, you just did that one. What's that? I think he's English. Yeah. Yeah. I did not know this, dude. I did not know that the drums were Synclavier. They were a drum machine. I did not know that. And yeah. like it, it's that good that it fools me because they sound so cavernous and huge, right? But now the symbol work is legit, but the, the other stuff is Dana, like, explaining how he would play a yeah. kit, I guess, right? Yeah. Was that really yeah. slow, a slow process? Um, yeah, I mean, it took some time from what I remember, probably more, more time than it would have taken if you, if you would have played them live. Yeah, I would guess, right? Yeah, I, you know, I remember Jim Morris and and um was in was in there working on the programming and uh another guy from Morris I'm trying to remember his name back then, maybe maybe it was Lex. Um but but it, it took it took some effort, you know, to get all that the drum programming done for sure. Well, did you feel when the album was done, when the final mix is done and you guys are all getting playbacks? Are you guys all sitting around there looking at each other like, fuck, dude, this is fucking epic, man. Like, I would have been like shit and bricks. I'd have been like greatest album ever written, man. Like, you know, like, was was that the feel? Was that the vibe? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we felt a lot of excitement for the way it was coming out when we were mixing it. Yeah, we're like, this is awesome. But I don't know if we felt like it was the greatest record ever made. But, well, that's just know. me talk. I don't know. I, I, like I said, it's right up there with hemispheres and rising you know what i mean yeah. well you know we were fans of those albums so it was for us to think that we could make something as good as a rock hemispheres i don't know yeah <laughs> um what uh know we, you know what, that we had made something that remarkable but i mean we we, we knew it was it was special you know sure. yeah but i mean like how does it feel now when you read things you see you know, polls of the album being reviewed by you know guys like Jeff Wagner or, or you know, I think you know who that is, I would assume, you know, Jeff Wagner. Um, he wrote Mean Deviation and Radical Research and uh, written a bunch of books. I mean, you know, this Transcendence is a classic U.S. power metal, progressive metal masterpiece, right? I mean, the songs are just I'll never forget when I got this CD, and I'm 99% sure, Jeff, uh, Ben, that I got it because I think I heard Headbangers Ball, like I said, the Lonely video. And I I literally put that CD in driving home, and I was just like, I, I just was like the whole drive, I must have been like this. <laughs> like, what the fuck is this, man? This is like, you know, the guitars, the drums, the everything, and Midnight's voice, everything is just like, it's like perfect. I mean, it's just a perfect album. It's a, it's a 10 out of 10 for me, and I know a lot of people. And and I'm just wondering, like, you your, your profile really starts to raise with this record, particularly in Europe, right? Yeah. And you go over, do you do a bunch of touring then off of it? Um, yeah, after Transcendence came out, we uh, went over and did a, a pretty long tour in Europe uh, as a support act for Doro. Um, you know Doro from Warlock? Oh, sure. Absolutely. That was a good tour. It was a few weeks long, you know, around Europe. And again, we played some festivals over there. At that time, we played the Dust Hammer Festival in Germany with Ozzy was the headliner and Queensryche was on the bill that night uh, with, you know, they were on support of the Operation Mind Crime Tour. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
they were at the top of their game, I think, right then. They were they were really badass, you know. Sure. So we got to play um, the Art Shock Festival again while we were on the Transcendence Tour. But this time it, it wasn't Metallica. It was a headliner. I think it was Queensryche was a headliner. Did you get over yeah. to um, the Grease then on this album? Um, on Transcendence, no, we, no? we didn't. Because you, that's really been a huge market for you guys. I mean, the Greek, the Greeks love you, man. Yeah, it turns out, you know, they do. So, um, we we didn't really play Greece until the Astronomica album came out. Okay, okay. wasn't I wasn't sure on that. Um, so we've been to Greece. Well, we we performed in Greece with Wade Black for the first time, and then we did do a, a one-off gig over there with Midnight. With Midnight, yeah. Uh, and then we did, you know, a couple of trips over there with Todd. Wanted to ask you about actually that. There's video. I'm sure you've seen it of the that midnight show in Greece. It's not great video. It's a you know fan video. You've seen it, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, who's the guy playing drums? Is that Rojas? Jesse Rojas. It is him. Um, no, well, Dana. Our original drummer is playing drums. Right. But we had Jesse Rojas there um, kind of as a second drummer. He was playing like a, a kit that he stands up behind. Yeah, and just percussion. Yeah. And cymbals. And uh, it was just something we did um, because Jesse had played with, with Crimson on the Astronomica tour when Dana was sort of stepped down for a while. And, uh, right. Jesse played drums as the primary drummer for the band on the Astronomica tour. So then when, when uh, we were going to go over and do this reunion gig with Midnight, um, you know, Jesse wanted to be a part of it, but Dana also wanted to come back and be a part of it. And we just had this idea to do a kind of a dual drummer thing for that gig. I was wondering was about just, that. And then does, does Jesse sing one of the songs too? When we ever did it. Um, I think Jesse did sing one of the songs from Astronomica that game. He gig. does. He does the Astronomics of Gods of War, I believe it is. Or Yeah. Oh. And I'm like, fuck that dude can scream. Because I thought maybe for a minute it was Wade because you can't, it's pretty far back. You can't really uh, tell. And I don't, yeah, it worked out well because I don't think Midnight really wanted to sing the Wade stuff. Right. And so Jesse said, well, I'll sing that song. And then as far as even backups for the rest of the song, um, Jesse's a good singer, so it was good to have him there where he could sing some high parts and be part of the backup vocals. You know, he's 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 been a, a part long of the brotherhood. Friend, part of the brotherhood for many years, still is, you know. Did you um so when Transcendence kind of, you do the European stuff, did you do any US touring on that? Oh yeah. Um for Transcendence, we, we did a full I don't know where the fuck I was, but I never heard about it, but go ahead. <laughs> In 1989, we did a U.S. tour where we played several states. Um, we, would, we, would, we were traveling kind of like headlining some of the metal clubs around the United States, and we would have uh, a lot of times the opening band would just be somebody from the town we were playing Local in. Band, yeah, mm-hmm. There was a, when we were playing up around Michigan, uh, we had the band Halloween pick up with us and play like a handful of the shows. I think they came around and played not just one, but maybe a few gigs with us. Oh, cool. And, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Dude, I have no idea how I missed that. I just. It was mostly us headlining, you know, metal clubs. And where we did the best were actually in Texas. We play in Texas and yeah. people were turn out and just go crazy for the band over there. Did you play um, Philly? Do you remember? Um, I'm trying to remember. I know we played Minneapolis and some of them northern cold states. We played Rhode Island and we played Boston. Probably would have hit uh, Philly somewhere then, maybe along the line. Have, and I got a pretty good memory for these clubs, but I'm, I don't I don't know if we played Philly. Is New, that York? Where you, New York City? I'm near Philly. Philly. We played New York. We played Lemoore's in Brooklyn. We played oh, yeah. a club called Zone DK that was uh, in in the Village, I think, in uh, Manhattan. Uh, we we played in, 
I think we played in Newark. You know, we we played at Toronto up in Canada. We played Detroit. You know, we we played a bunch of gigs uh, all over North America. We ended up going over and playing Seattle and the West Coast, uh, L.A. We played. We went down and played Mexico, Tijuana. So when that when the touring wraps for that, um, and I, I did want to mention too that you had the video for Lonely, and I was thinking. Like, where did you shoot that at? Was it, did you shoot that in Florida? Yeah, Tampa. Was how 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 was that? Was it a bit of a mind fuck that you're doing like a video for like MTV? Like, uh, yeah, it was fun. I mean, because it was our first one. Yeah, MTV, MTV was taken off back then. It was mm -hmm. the, you were going to be a band with with uh, anything going on for yourselves record wise. You had to have a video had too. To have a video, yeah. We were lucky enough that our label, Roadrunner at the time, put up, you know, some money to advance us to make a video, and that was our, our video. Did you, as a, you guys as a band have any input on the treatment, or did you just bring a script guy in to put something together, or? A um, little bit of both. I think we, you know, we sort of had this idea of having a girl be part of it to, to coincide with the storyline a little bit, but. Um, honestly, I don't really remember having a script guy or a director from, <laughs> from the label, but yeah, maybe there was, it seems like there was a guy there when we were all up in those boxes doing the video shoot that day. Cause I remember yeah. somebody, somebody telling me a lot, like move around more, move a lot, move a lot, move around, you know, sway around, sway around. And I was, do that ax thing, right? Like like this, like this, or like yeah, that's great. Like that, more of that, more of that. I'm just like, okay. <laughs> that's fucking yeah. hilarious, man. It's a cool yeah. video, man. It's it's kind of like a dream sequence video, like it's all a dream, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's that that's that's a cool thing. Um, let's see. Oh, I wanted to mention this too, real quick. The Manatee Civic Center. You guys played in Bradenton. That big civic center was like five thousand people, I think. Yeah. And, and this is eighty nine, I believe it was February of eighty nine, and you guys were simulcast on Z Rock. And I watched that the other day, and I'd never seen that before. Now, again, it's VHS quality tape, and it does the you know that kind of weird stuff, and it's not the greatest clarity. But yeah, the best part is uh, I, I want to get this right when. Drenning's introducing the band. He calls you Ben the Dr. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> What's all that all about, Ben? <laughs> oh wow. I don't I didn't even remember that he did that. He did. It's right here. He's like Ben the Dr. Jackson. Dude, I don't know. I mean that, that could get me in trouble if I told yeah, you. Yeah, I, I was gonna say. <laughs> Maybe yeah, maybe we better just leave that alone. Um, I'm sure it was an inside joke. And then, what what memories do you have of that? Like, and did you guys ever think about trying to gather the footage, or I, you probably didn't own the footage? I'm gathering, but you know, getting the licensing it and putting a VHS of that out. Um, you know, that would be cool. These are things sometimes we talk about through the years and don't end up doing, but we don't really have to because it's already out there bootlegged by enough people so you know <laughs> the water is there. speaking of bootlegs just saying <laughs> um yeah. yeah i mean well the thing is like the the video copy that's up on youtube you know, about that show is uh i think i think we put on a pretty good show that night i think the band was pretty on that night oh, it was yeah you know, it, it, it looked good midnight midnight was having a good night and overall even if it's the the quality is a little old looking because of the VHS or, but I do remember there was like a, a video crew there and um, you know well, they, I think I think they captured the band in a good in a good way that night so I'm I'm glad that footage exists. Oh, dude, it was huge smoke and fog machines and crazy good lights and it, it just yeah. looked like massive. I think we were kind of. Maybe maybe we were kind of peaking right then, as far as you know, at that stage in that era of the band, we were you know we were uh, 
peaking. So was it was, it's really was and this may this may be where you don't want to get into it, but and if you don't, you just say I don't want to talk about that. Um, was mid at this point struggling at all, or was because you mentioned that he was having a good night? So I'm, um, I, I know we all know everybody knows the struggles he had, right? And we're not here to cast judgment or even talk much about. I'm just curious that there was there had to have been some up and down nights with that, right? And yeah. Or, you know, transcending North American tour, you know, he, he had some, some, some nights that were a little struggle for him, but for the most part, he was, he had, he, he did really well on the tour. He was doing pretty well. Yeah. Um, you guys come over from that tour, I guess you go your separate ways to get some space for a little while and then, then what? John or uh, Ben, what what happens then? We finished out that year. We went over to Japan actually, and did a pretty cool tour tour over there to finish out the Transcendence North American tour. We went over to Japan. Oh, nice! Then we came back and shot over to Texas one more time. And decided we hit Texas again because we did so well there on the first part of the tour. We thought we'd go back, and I think we did New Year's Eve over there, and and uh. And then that kind of finished out the year in 1989. Uh, shortly after that, you know, a few weeks later, right into January of 1990, I kind of was talking to Jeff on the phone and got the gist of the, what they wanted to do, and which was move forward with the strange and beautiful sort of new music direction and a direction of just using John on guitar. So I was, you know, wasn't really happy about it. I was like, well, why do you guys want to do that now? But but, you know, I think maybe it was more more something John wanted to try and experiment with. And he sort of bent the, got the other guy's ear on it a little bit and maybe talked them into it. But it's just, uh, it's just a phase the band went through and something they wanted to try. So, so Dana and I went off and uh, worked on another album. Well, yeah. I, I'm... From my perspective, if I start a band and bring another guitar player in, and that guy, even if he's the better guitar player and the better writer, and then he comes to me, or, well, it doesn't sound like he came to you. It sounds like Jeff did. He comes to you and says, by the way, we're going to move on without you. I'm going to be fucking livid pissed. <laughs> That's me. Yeah, I mean, I probably was, but, you know, in the same – what am I going to say? I mean, they made a decision. This is what they want to do. Uh, I think a after the first two albums came out and the band got so much press and kind of about how the how great the albums really were and this and that and the other. Right. Uh, you know, maybe John got a little bit of a, a head about him and just thought, you know, this is largely this is me. This is me. It's me. I don't know. He, he seemed like that kind of guy, you know. We, we, you know, I'm not trying to talk him down either. It's just kind of the reality. He kind yeah, of had, yeah, yeah. he kind of had an ego, and I think he got a little carried away with it, and just said, "I, you know, I want, I want to be the only guitar player. I can do this. You know, do we really need Ben?" And 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 I think it's just an, an idea that came up with him, and he wanted to try that. So and um, you didn't, you didn't even remotely think about legal action. You know, no. I mean, why would I? I mean, when, when when you're working with friends and brothers in a band, and they suddenly give you the feeling that they don't want you in there, are you going to try to sue them into keeping you? I mean, it, well, it's like, I, I get where you I get where you're coming from, but I mean, I'm not the kind of person that's going to stick around in a situation where maybe I'm no longer wanted or appreciated. So I just yeah. thought. I have more to offer than maybe these guys are recognizing right now. And then maybe it's time for me to go out and, and venture into some other things right now and just kind of wish them well. Um, I didn't want to quit, well, how, but I, I felt how, like I was kind of being edged out. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, for sure. You know, I, I kind of knew it was more coming from, from maybe John's perspective of something he wanted to try, like some new experimental things he wanted to try with the band, going in a little more commercial direction. Yeah. To see how maybe, you know, maybe they could possibly elevate the band to 
a step higher, you know, on the platform of a, of a real, very well-known band. Even though the band was getting to be pretty well-known with Transcendence, I think they thought, well, if we go a little more commercial, just think what we might be able to achieve. So, Yeah, and the, and the, the musical climate was changing a lot then in the early 90s. You had Nirvana and the Seattle thing kind of exploding, and metal was kind of being edged out in in – deference to yeah. the grunge thing right you know that's what every label was looking was a grunge band right well yeah and even well i think even grunge didn't even really so much fall into popularity until maybe after that third crimson came out because that one came out in like 90 90 91 i thought it was yeah, but, yeah um and then the grunge popularity thing fell right after and over the next several years but well, how do you think they were trying to be part of the grunge trend or anything, but maybe they just wanted to be a little more mainstream? With why, that did third they, why did they, why did they, why did they, a little more mainstream? Because to me, the record sounded a little Zeppelin y in, in, in some ways, stuff like that. And, and, you know, it was a cool record, but as I say, it was just something they wanted to try which I didn't really w agree with and I didn't really want to leave the band. But again, I don't have the kind of personality where I'm going to stick around where I'm not wanted. So yeah. it turned out inside that and I went off and did other things. And Dana and I made another record that was, you know, got really great reviews, the parish and vision record. Yeah. I, I sent you a, I sent you a text about that, that, uh, that cost me $40 that, that review, that interview. Hurt your wallet, yeah. <laughs> it hurt my wallet for sure. Because yeah. I forgot yeah. about that. I think they're getting a lot for that rare album. Um, I got I got the version with the DVD on it, so I got the the good one, one of the originals. But it cost me about forty five dollars. Oh wow! Which Sorry, I was you got like, it. I was like, whatever, Sorry. man. I'm gonna get it because it's a great album. Thanks, man. I'm glad you like it. You know, Dana and I just put our heart into that album, you know, for a couple of years after we left Crimson and we worked on that together. And, and uh, we, you know, we wish those guys well, and I'm sure they in their way wished us well. It was too bad that we kind of had to split the band off like that right after two years, two albums or, you know, oh. that were successful. But something that I think John wanted to experiment with a change and sort of got the other guys on on that mindset to go along with it. And at that time, Midnight was kind of drinking a lot during the whole Transcendence tour. And yeah. and he was probably, you know, they could have talked him into anything because he wasn't really like, you know. Right. In the right state. In the right state of mind to probably yeah. fight for, for Ben and Dana, his bros, and say, you know, you don't really want to do that. It's not the best idea. He probably just went, okay, if that's what you want to do. And, well, you know how it real is. quick question on Dana. Quick question on Dana, though. Like they put out the, uh, the Strange and Beautiful album, and then right after the album came out, they ended up firing Midnight almost immediately after that album came out. Oh, really? Okay, for for the issues. They hired another singer named David Van Landing that took Midnight's place for the tour for the Strange and Beautiful North American tour. Oh, because, wow. uh, as I said, you know. It, it seemed at, at that period in time of Crimson that John just felt like maybe the band was all about him and he had a yeah. bit of an ego. He felt like he could just fire anybody and that would just be acceptable. The band would be okay. I don't know. First, so he, first, it, was, first it was Dana and I, and then it was Midnight. And then, and then the band, then they just, Jeff and John were the only ones left and they just kind of dissolved the band for about yeah. a decade. Yeah. What, real quick question on Dana, if I could. Um, when were you the first one that was told we don't really want you, and then they decided to let Dana go because you guys were kind of together and so close? Yeah, I, I sort of think it was that. Yeah, I think they they let me know, and then I let Dana know that they kind of told me that I'm not really needed now. They're working on some new material, a new album, and don't really know if I'm needed. They kind of Jeff sort of told me gently in a phone call that that was kind of the gist of the way him and John were feeling or something. And, and maybe if I would have talked to John first on the phone, he would have told me, I just think, you know, it was, I happened to 
ring up Jeff one day and shortly after the transcendence tour was over and I said, Hey, uh, are you guys getting together, working on new material? Can I come over and join you? I would like to be involved, whatever. And he said, I don't know if we really need you right now. Something like that. Oh. And I, I told Dana about the, that. And he was like, well, I'm not going anywhere. I think he still felt like he was going to stay, but, but then I think he sort of got the message from them shortly after me that they had other plans for another drummer as well. So, jeez, and you and you speculate it was because you and Dana started the band. You guys were close, tight. Yeah, maybe they thought if we're going to let Ben go, we should let them go together so they yeah, can. Yeah, we do don't something. want his best friend still in the band. <laughs> maybe they won't. I don't know if they felt like they weren't that happy with Dana or, or maybe they could find a better uh, fit for the band. I don't really know what their mindset was and what? letting him go. I mean, he, he was, you know, fantastic drummer and they didn't really need to let him go. But was, were you guys dropped by MCA or did Atlantic come in and buy that contract out then after we were dropped by MCA? Which is crazy when you think about it, because I find that incredibly hard to believe that that album didn't make a big enough splash sales wise that they're like, oh, we've we've got something here. We want to invest a lot more money in it. But clearly it didn't at the time. Maybe it grew over the years, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So the band. Yeah. They will but, sometimes take a shot on a band back then and. If, if it didn't sell right away or maybe they wouldn't stick with it or, you know, there was a right after MCA kind of picked up transcendence from road runner from road racer. They, they took it over, just put it out on MCA shortly after that, they dropped the band. And then uh, after they let Dana and I go, the manager um, got them picked up by Atlantic for the third album. Right. Right. And you made the point, well, you after that, came out, they were dropped by Atlantic, but, right. but things were changing, like you say, and the things that were becoming popular right then, you know, were starting to change, and maybe yeah. Atlantic, maybe Atlantic didn't really feel like that album was, was really going to succeed for them, so they didn't get it's, really get behind it. It's a, um, bit of a, it's a bit of a schizophrenic album. It's got some really good songs and some kind of weird songs that just don't they don't work for me. The more ballady things that are like not, you know, like Transcendence has cool ballads on it, like kick ass metal, beautiful ballads like Painted Skies and Burning Bridges and Lonely. And and Strange, Strange and Beautiful just has some kind of weird stuff on it. Like that one song with the, the female singer on it is it's like, man, I just cannot get into it, you know? Um yeah. So um, that, like you said, it ended up that album ended up in the cutout bin. I got it in a cutout bin for a dollar. Yeah, I saw it there myself. Like yeah. within within the year after it came out, I saw yeah. it in the cutout in the record store. So you do the um, Parish thing with Dana, right? And and people that don't know about this album need to go check it out. It's um, give me the name of it again. Envision? No. Envision. Yeah. It's just it's it's kind of what Crimson Glory might have could have should have would have been after Transcendence, but it's different. I mean, because you don't have Midnight singing. The guy that sings on it's very very good. Uh, a little bit more melodic in the direction of maybe slightly more radio friendly, just ever so slightly, not a lot, but a little less yeah. proggy metal, a little yeah. more more straightforward. But it's a really killer album. I'm looking forward to getting that in, um, yeah. and then what happens then there's just there's some reformations in there that kind of come and go briefly for some touring for the next umpteen uh, years until the todd thing happens yeah you know after or i'm sorry way black and then we get to astronomica 90s were the 90s you know we all crimson broke up and dana and i did perish and jeff and dana or jeff and john did a couple of albums together in one band called crush another band called erotic liquid culture. Yeah. I've never and, and checked they, those out. Well, they're, they're cool albums. You know, they, they did some stuff. It was really, uh, 
a little more on the funky side, you know, some of the rhythmic stuff and the bass okay. work is really cool stuff. Um, each, each of those two bands had a different vocalist, which was a lot different. So one project was pretty different from the other. So that was some stuff John and Jeff were up to. Um, Dana and I were up to what we were doing with Parrish. And uh, by the time the late 90s came along, um, Jeff and John had an idea to bring back Crimson, and which originally started with them wanting to work with Mid again. But it didn't really come together, so they they got together with Wade Black, and uh, then they asked me to come back and rejoin. And uh, but you weren't tour. on that album. You didn't actually play on that album, right? Play on the album. They they sort of worked on it, just John and Jeff, and they had a drum machine on that one, and they worked with Wade, and they had a couple other vocalists come in and do backup stuff and help with some of the lyric writing and. But, um, you know, they, they pretty much had that record finished up before they reached back out to me to rejoin the band. How, getting that call, were you surprised? Or um, or had the lines of communication sort of semi still been open? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Maybe a little surprised, but not, not too surprised. You know, they said they wanted to bring the band back and uh, – they were getting back to more like two guitar player type compositions and stuff that would require two guitar players. And, and, you know, in order to go back and play all the original stuff on tour again from the first two albums and play it well. And, you know, they really needed two guitar players. John kind of knew that, you know, doing the one guitar player thing in Crimson maybe didn't work out so well um, on the strange and beautiful you know, experiment. So, and that was what year was Astronomica? Because I don't have that in my notes. Um, was that 01? No, 99. Oh, was it 99? Okay. I thought it was not 01. Um, yeah, and the tour was actually in, I think, the year 2000 was when we went over and, and uh, toured Europe, did like seven countries and wow, uh, did a European tour in support of Astronomica. And so we, did pretty... a, we did a couple dates in the States, you know. Not a tour, but just a few small one offs. One offs, yeah. Yeah, and, and that like um so that that album did pretty well, I believe, over in Europe. I don't know that it did as well here, but it, it did over in Greece and Europe, it was much, much better received. Um, how did you guys know Wade Black or how did they he was in Camelot, right? Oh uh, no, he he sang with a band called Lucian Black. Oh from Lucian. okay. Uh, they were from Tampa area, and uh, you know, I think maybe John and Jeff caught him out at a at a local gig and a local metal club one night, and uh, when they were working on new material for Astronomica, and they saw him and said, "Well, it, the communications between them and Midnight started out, but didn't really come together." So I think they said, "Well, we're going to have to look for someone else," and they they talked to Wade, and you know. Wade was interested, so they they brought him in. And did you know? Did you know Wade before? Well, I, did, I didn't. I think I had also probably had seen his band out maybe once in a local gig at Lucian Black. Right. I do remember seeing him. He was this, you know, really intense guy with a mohawk, blonde mohawk back then, and you know, had a lot of stage charisma. And uh, I remember seeing his band as well. But when they told me that's who they were using, I, I knew who he was, but okay. I, didn't really, I didn't really know him. But the first time I came out to John's studio that he had in his basement at the time on Anna Maria Island, uh, Wade was there, and they introduced me to Wade. And Wade and I hit it off right away. We, we really uh, – Oh, cool. You know, yeah. yeah, I don't want to speak too much about that album because, to be honest with you, I don't own it. I just ordered it. I figured oh. it was time that I got it. But man, I just was, I heard it back in the day and I just wasn't ready for, I wasn't ready for Crimson Glory Without Midnight. There was something about that that I just struggled oh. with, you know? What's that? I understand. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. just, so. It, it's one of those things. It's like some bands you just, you, 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 you have a nostalgia trip for, right? It's like, man, I just don't want to let go. 
of that girlfriend, you know, <laughs> it's like all the other girlfriends look like that girlfriend, that kind of thing. Right. Um, so I want to get you out of here shortly here quick. Cause I've kept you a long time tonight, but I did want to, um, uh, I wanted to ask you something. This is an interesting one. I just thought of this in the booklet for transcendence. You guys thank auto drive. Does that bring a bell to you? Yeah. The band auto drive. Did you know yeah. those guys? Yeah, back around the time that we were uh, working on Transcendence, our manager, Warren, was also a manager for Auto Drive. They were like a Tampa band. Um, the guitar player, I think his name was Wes Durth. John, John, West, well, Wes is, we call him Wes, Wesley Durth. John, yeah. John's a good friend of mine. Know him really, really well from, he went on to play at Porcupine Tree. Oh, he did. That's yeah. right. Okay. So what was the bass player's name too? I remember him from. I I don't uh, know. I don't know the bass player. I knew, the, the drummer is Mark Prater. Mark, Mark Prater. Prater. Was, yeah, he's the one that owned uh, Red Room Recorders, which uh, a lot of the yeah. guys use for like obituary, and he did a lot of engineering for that. More sound too for a bunch of years. He I did think. work there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know the bass player's name. I know they had a singer that was kind of like a. Real good looking dude, like real sexy, long ass hair. He looked like kind of like a more butch, beefed up Bon Jovi guy. And they sort of yeah. sounded like Bon Jovi, kind of a little bit heavier. Well, I remember seeing Auto Drive out in the clubs a few times back then yeah. because our manager was managing them. And I, I remember they were good. They, I liked them. It's funny. I, I was looking through the credits. I, I don't know. Why you're. Why we thank them. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe they did something for us when we were in the studio or loaned well, us some. I think, I think Wes with a gig or something. I don't know. I think Wes said he opened up for you guys once. They opened yeah, for you. Maybe that was. I think you're right. I think we played this club in Bradenton back then. That's, called that's what it was. I think they did play with that night. Now yeah. that you mention it, because I I sent a picture to Wes. I'm like, dude, what the fuck is this? You like you know the. Crimson Glory guys? He's like, yeah, I opened for those guys one time. He's like, yeah, yeah, cool guys, man. Interesting band, you know, really great players and all that stuff. So, but yeah, I know, I've known Wes since, God, man, 2002, three, something like that, going pretty far back. Give him my best. I will, man, for sure. Um, let's see. I just want to hit a couple quick things here. Uh, Hang on one sec here, Ben. I'm just getting a little lost here. Okay, so when you do the Astronomica thing, you guys then kind of go back into sort of a, I don't know, like, I guess like a, a hibernation period, I guess you could call it, or you know, a separation period again for a while. And then you do the midnight thing in 2006 over in Greece. I, I guess that festival came with the right amount of money and the right, Offer to get you guys over there, and 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 you did it. And I thought it was a good show, considering. I mean, Mid was definitely at that point in time. He was not as not well, I would assume. Um, yeah. And but he is pretty good in that show. He's pretty he's pretty sharp most of the the show uh, vocally. Cool. Yeah. Um. What? Uh, but then somehow, you guys after i guess midnight passed in 2008 right yeah um i'd imagine like were you guys remotely in contact with him or not so much um yeah a little bit here and there you know after that uh the grease show we weren't really working together you know on any new music or plans to do more shows but but uh, I, I would see him here and there, you know. It's, it's a small town. We're, we're all kind of friends. Right. <laughs> so, um, I mean, did you see that coming, or yeah, did, were you worried yeah. about that? At the time, you know, maybe a couple years before he passed, there were a few gigs. I used to play out by myself and do acoustic gigs at some places. And, you know, Midnight would sometimes come out and sit in. Oh, and nice. sit with sing a song or two. You know stuff like that. So yeah, we we had contact. I mean, did did you see it coming? 
No, not really. I mean, I I, I knew that that he kind of tend to drink too much, you know, over the years, and that it yeah. was it wasn't really that good for him, and that maybe you know he should taper off. And we all kind of hoped that he would never lead to anything that would affect his health, or or you know, of course we or kill him. You know, it's something right. we never something we never really thought of. You know, we saw and could tell that you know he had a bit of a problem with overindulging when he drank, but, um, you know, you know, we never thought it would kill him. Um, was it, I mean, was it, so it was a bit of a shock then. I mean, I guess pretty heavy. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Losing a friend. I, I sort of remember after we did the, the gig in Greece where he, he was struggling, I remember saying something to Dana when we were driving around on the road, maybe over there after the gig, like, man, if midnight doesn't like start taking better care of himself, you know, we, we might not have him in another five years. Wow. And I was just kind of like kidding in a way, but. But you were my, just commenting and thought that went through your head. I made that comment. I remember to Dana, like maybe the day after the grease gig and, and, you know, and as it turned out, it was, it was true. Five years prophetic. later. He, prophetic. Yeah. Um, and then. You guys, from after midnight's passing, was when did the talks about doing the? Did they come for prop power? They came to you guys to to do this thing in honor of mid, or was it how that all work out? Like how the Todd thing come together? Well, I mean, I knew the I knew I knew of prog power and the guys up there and the guy that promotes it, Glenn, and I had been up there a few as a spectator and one year I sat in and played a song with Camelot. So, you know, I, we knew them. I, I don't remember if they came to us or if we thought let's reach out to them because it would be a good place to do a tribute show. I don't only really remember whose right. idea for us to do this tribute show at Prague power, but, but that's the idea that came along and we decided to do a, a show there to, to tribute midnight using all these other singers from the different bands that were there that weekend. Right. He's coming on stage, you know, in most cases we had like two guys on stage for each song, like almost duetting the yeah. songs. Um, and Todd was one of the guys that came up and sang that night. And uh, he just made an impression on us. You know, we, we had him at, we had him down to our rehearsal place a couple times before the show to, to rehearse with us and we even started seeing then that he had something pretty special and and he wasn't in another band like all the other guys that were singing there at the prog power thing these guys right. were all you know guys from famous bands todd todd was just a drummer from the saint pete area you know and very serious about drumming and playing drums as a young man and i don't think he ever really knew himself that he, he could sing like that he was going to be a singer or pursue singing, but yeah, he, I mean, he knew he could sing, but I don't know if that was really something he was pursuing to do, but he came out and sang with us at uh, our rehearsals and we invited him to come up and sing a song at Prog Power. And uh, something after that just kind of told us that he was going to be a good fit for Crimson Glory as a, as a new singer, maybe for a new chapter. And then you guys did a lot of touring with him quite a bit, right? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. There's um uh, some footage over in Greece of a show that you did. I can't remember. I didn't note it here. I want to say 2011, I think it was. Um, and it's a killer gig. I think it's in Athens. And what yeah. I noticed is then you started using a keyboard player. Who was that? Uh, his, his name is John Zahner. And um, he's, he's toured with Crimson Glory way back in the days of Transcendence when we did the European tours with Doro oh. and um, he was on the tour when we toured with Doro and he played on transcendence. Okay. So he was the synth guy then. Yeah. I yeah. didn't. Okay. I didn't actually know that. Was he out on the stage or was he behind the stage during the early days or what? The old days um, on the transcendence tour in Europe. I think he was more of a side stage, almost not so much scene. Yeah, we even 
He even had his uh, girlfriend at the time, Janelle Sadler, um, sang on Transcendence, did backing vocals on the album, and she toured no with him. No way. Yeah, so when we were uh, when we were in Europe touring, like uh, for the Transcendence tour, the Doro tour, um, we had both him and her like hidden behind stage. He was playing keyboards and she was singing. How about that? That's awesome. But now you know. So that we, explains that explains something to me. They both played on the Transcendence album, but they also toured with us. But here's the thing, Ben. I was wondering about this because I know you did. You were the only other guy. Well, John did a little bit, but you were the only other guy that did a lot of backing vocals live. Um, yeah. And I don't know what you sang, whether you sang lower or higher harmonies or 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 what that was. But um, and you can tell me. But but I wondered. And the Manatee show, that Manatee Civic Center show, I was hearing a higher, like a soprano. And now it explains it. Was she at that show? Yeah. That's what I was hearing. I was like, where's, how's mids, like, how's, how's he doing those two octave things? Cause it, it didn't sound like an octave splitter vocal thing back then. It sounded like another real voice. Yeah. Yeah. That her. explains it. When you sang, what parts did you usually sing? Like a higher harmony or? No, more like mid, mid stuff, you know, lower parts or mid parts. Um, every now and then, I think when, when Midnight and I would sing like the part in, in Dark Places or, or when Todd and I did, I think I actually sang the higher part where he sang the lower part. But, yeah. um, but I don't really have a high range, no. Maybe for certain parts, I might do a part that's a little higher than my normal range, which is more of the, the middle to lower stuff. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, just, I was curious because I do notice yeah. in a lot of the early footage, you're singing a lot of the backing stuff. Yeah, um, and, and every now and then it might be a line that's got a little bit of a higher melody to it, but for the most part, it's more than the middle range stuff because I don't have a super. But um, John Zahner does, our, our keyboard player. He, he's he got a higher range than I do, and he does a lot of the higher. Oh, he did stuff too then, okay. Oh, yeah, the harmonies, and, and when we toured with Todd, um, you know, we didn't use any tapes or anything so yeah no no um, you can tell that yeah anything vocal wise you were hearing on the todd tours was just todd and and uh john's honor and i so the story is that you guys do a bunch of touring and then with todd and then you kind of get to a point where you're you know it's time to maybe do some recording and it just doesn't happen. And, and I mean, with Todd and then Todd gets the, the Queens, right. Call. And I, the way I understand it, the way Todd's told, the way you told it is that, you know, he just got sick and tired of waiting around to, to do an album. And, you know, from what I understand, that was more dreading than anything else. Like what happened there? Like it just, just never manifested. Yeah. I, you know, like I told the story before, John just, stopped coming around that much. I mean, we, after we did the, the few tours with Todd, we actually said, okay, we're home now. We're all wanting to do a new album. Let's, let's get together at our rehearsal room every Monday. We picked a night a week and we were getting together those nights every week anyway, to rehearse, to prepare for the tours we did. We right. said, now that we're over, let's keep getting together every night, every week on this night. And let's try to write some new music as a band. Thanks. And, and we, out. Right. You know, we did it for about a month and we wrote maybe like two new songs. And then, you know, um, John just kind of stopped coming. He, he, he missed a couple where we would work on stuff without him. And then he eventually just stopped coming and Todd got kind of fed up and he just made his decision to leave the band and join Queens, right? Um, did, did he ever give you an indication of why did just, just lost interest? Yeah, I mean, obviously he was, he, he had a son right around that time, you know, his son was born and, and, um, you know, maybe he had some other things going on, other business ventures or things he wanted to do, or, you know, it's, he just wasn't really showing, uh, he wasn't attending. So, um, he just didn't seem to have an interest in it. Not fully. No, things, things were changing with him and, and you know, I don't want to get into talking about his personal life and things. I, I he know was, we won't we won't touch that. I get it. I know about that. Yeah. 
John wasn't really uh, committing himself to working on this new album with Todd the way we thought everyone was going to commit to. So um, he, Todd left. And, you know, we talked a little bit about replacing Todd right then because, well, we had momentum at the time. And, right. But it wouldn't have meant just replacing Todd. We would have had to find a replacement for Todd and also and John. Uh, not saying that this couldn't be done, but we just weren't really sure if that's what we wanted to do at the time. And Jeff and Dana and we all kind of just went back to working on solo things and alternative projects for a handful of years, you know, until uh, a few years ago, Jeff and Dana and I decided we, you know, we wanted to work something. We wanted to work on something with Crimson again. Yeah. Can you, we'll touch on that quick and then get you out of here. Like, so what, what was the, what was the impetus? Was there, you know, did, did you call up Dana or did, you know, who, who got the fire started again? Well, you know, we, we had some, uh, somebody bring to our attention a good singer that they thought might be interesting to us. So we all checked him out and, and uh, we all did think this guy was pretty interesting. So that this uh, person, is one of the one of the catalysts to us kind of getting back together and making us want to work on some new music. And the, Is that the guy, Mystique, um, sounded a lot like Midnight, which crazy, crazy man. <laughs> similarities, and we thought, hey, this might be a uh, interesting. So, uh, but things didn't really materialize to to the full potential with him. So. Um, we, but we, but we were then, you know, after Dana and Jeff and I put some effort into writing a couple songs, a couple musical pieces. We said, yeah, let's, let's move forward. Let's just find another singer. Um, we thought, we all felt like there's, there's probably a lot of singers out there with, that would love the opportunity to try to sing for Crimson Glory. Oh, so, hell let's, yeah. so let's put the word out. And we did. And we, you know, we were right. There's, there's a lot of people that really wanted to give it a try. And, we, we talked to a few really good candidates before we ended up um, settling and deciding on uh, Travis Wills would be the guy. Yeah. And so you guys, you, you released uh, right before Christmas, you released a video of uh, I'm going to say the word wrong. Tris, Triskade, Triska Dideka. Triska Deca. Triska, Triska Deca. Okay. 310. Is that what it means? 310 or. Yeah, um, it it means it's the way you say thirteen. You know, it means thirteen in Greek. Okay. Or it could mean you know three and ten. But what's it, the what's the symbolism there? It's a uh, like you know that the a lot of people think uh, the number thirteen is unlucky. Right. It goes back, you know, century or more ago. That it goes back, and it's not just. One part of the world is pretty much all over the world. I mean, it's sure. just a, a worldwide phenomenon that, like, people think black cats are unlucky, or if you yeah. break a meat, it's unlucky. People think that the the number thirteen is uh, unlucky, or or some people have an intense fear of the number. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, there's even a terminology called triskaidekaphobia that you could yeah, find. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think. Uh, Doctors or you know, or psycho psychologists maybe made this terminology as far back as like around 1910. Okay, where they, where they made that a word, a term, triskaidekaphobia. And uh, you Google the term or look it up in the dictionary. It just it means the intense fear of the number 13. Okay, so we we thought it would be a cool topic to write a song about. And um, is this uh? Who wrote the song? Oh, no. Um, and, and there you are. You're back. You're back. The song turned out to be not just about um, 13 being unlucky, but the song's kind of about superstition as a whole, you know, right. about, about, you know, superstitions of things like black hats, broken mirrors, the number 13. Who, who wrote the song? All The three of you guys or? Yeah, all, all of us. All of all of you? Um, Jeff, Jeff and I wrote a lot of the music and the parts, and, you know, the, the riffs and changes parts and stuff. And uh, Dana wrote his own drum parts, of course. And 
our new guitar player Borgie did the solo, wrote his own solo, and you know, you know. That's right. Your new guitar player is what's his name, Mark Borgmeyer. Mark Borgmeyer. Yeah. And where did he come from? Um, he's a local guy. He lives in Sarasota here with us. We've been friends with him for many years. And was he in any other bands that we know of, or? Yeah. Um, he was in a band called Steel Angel. Back back in the early days of Crimson, and they were a band that played music similar in style to Crimson. And I think um, they did one album that they they that they released uh, on a Greek label some years ago. And I'm not saying they were a, a really big or well known band, but but that's kind of where his roots lie. He played with them. Um, he's played with a lot of local people around here. He's played with me for years. Um, played guitar with me on on two or three solo records I've made. Right. Uh, really good guy. We get along with him really well, Dana and Jeff and I. And uh, he, he plays the Crimson stuff really well, too. And he's, he's a good writer. He writes cool parts. You have a second song, too, right? Did, was that released? Because I couldn't find it out on YouTube yeah. yet. Not yet. We were going to let the first one um, ride for a couple months, you know, right. and just – get a little momentum and see how, you know, people enjoy that one, you know, how second they take track it. called what's second track called. The second track is called indelible ashes. Okay. Um, which is actually completely done, recorded, mixed, everything mastered. We were, we were going to release as the second single, but um, you know, we, we may even opt now to release another song prior to that one. Cause we have another one in the fires right now. And it's a little faster, a little more of a faster paced song. Okay. Where Delible Ash is a little, is a little more of a, of a heavy, but yet mid paced sort of tempo rocker, kind of like, kind of like the first one we put out, Triscadeca. Right. And we were, we were recently discussing amongst ourselves that maybe, maybe the next song we put out, we might want to put out something a little more fast. A little more red sharky. Yeah, a little more red shark. So we might surprise everybody and drop a second single here that is actually not indelible ashes, but okay. another. Song. So I yeah. heard you say, uh, well, I guess two two quick questions then, and we'll wrap here. Um, the one is, are you getting label interest? Are people calling? Are yeah, yeah, we've already had a couple labels um, reach out, message us, and say that they be interested in, in, in working with Crimson on a new album. So um, it, it's very nice. That, promising. Promising and nice that the interest is there, that, you know, people are interested. Um, it's just, I think we want to take it a little slow and just maybe get, get a couple more songs uh, completed and, and just, you know, just talk to, talk to a few different people before we just do Jump. anything to, up on the first deal yeah but yeah. not that these uh the first couple deals that were offered us aren't great deals or from very good people you know they are but we're just we haven't made up our minds yet about anything like that you know like which label we're going to work with or what direction we're going to go but um yeah we should say and you did say in this one interview that uh you know right now the the, the if you read the comments, and I'm sure you have to some degree, you read the comments under the videos and stuff like that. It's all, when's the new album coming out? Like assuming that you just had an album ready to go, right? <laughs> so yeah, I've noticed that too. Um, unfortunately, you know, to, to the fans that no, we don't have a complete album ready to go right now, but but it's in the works, and and we're cap very capable of delivering on a full album, and we will. But uh, but we. We we record written and recorded two new singles, prepared them for release, and decided we wanted to drop these two singles, and 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 see what the reaction was. You know, upon everyone learning the band was returning, and we weren't just going to say the band's back and go start playing festivals and just be a nostalgia act and play yeah. the old material. We figured, hey, if we're going to announce the band's back, we're going to at least have a brand new song. Uh, lyric video and something brand new that we can say and here it is the here's something brand new yeah and, and if people like it we have another song we can follow up with immediately say well here's another one yeah but, yeah uh, people will just have to be a little patient with us 
if if their excitement now has them um, wishing for a full album. And uh, yeah. uh, I'm really glad that everybody wants a full album from the band, and we can we can definitely make that happen. So, so you're happy with the response thus far? Yeah, yeah, definitely stoked about um, it. I guess the the one little ghost in the room is. Did you guys consider bringing Drenning in, or did you even talk to him, or was that kind of off the table right away? Honestly, we no, we didn't even consider him. Um, you know, he's he's been doing his own thing for the last 10, 12 years. Uh, sort of, we haven't had much communication at all, and he's raising his son, and, and we've kind of heard – that he just doesn't really have in, interest in doing music right now. And um, maybe for the better for us, you know, yeah. Yeah. There might be yeah. some, some circumstances that are also a little behind the scenes where certain things that didn't really sit well with us that they, that he may have done in some of our past. So uh, maybe it's just time for us to move in a different direction. Clean break. Clean break. You know, we don't have anything specifically bad, you know, that we'd like to say about John. We're not that way. We don't want to throw mud at anybody. But, uh, yeah. you know, we definitely have some good memories together and, and some great legacy of things we've did we've done together. And at this point, uh, just, just wish him all the best and uh, with his family life and, you know, his fatherhood, his son, and everything that he's doing now. Well, that's great. Just, I mean, look, you know, being a father's – a big deal. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's so, important, uh, important shit. Maybe um, uh, we're sort of uh, just happy to just do something a little different this time too. Maybe with a little, a little different personnel. Well, listen, Ben, man, I I commandeered you for two hours. I'm sorry, but the, usually when you Ooh, when people come on good. with me, they never get. What's that? Yeah, it's past my bedtime. What's going I'm on? Sorry, I'm sorry, Ron. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're an old guy, man. Come on. <laughs> Listen, man, it's been a, a real joy to get to know you. Please, let's keep in contact, man, if I can help help out yeah. in any way, shape, or form. I do have some decent connections in the music business to certain labels, too. So, well, you know, by all means, you got my – I'll send you my contact, direct contact information. And uh, if, you know, you need anything, just reach out and, you know, don't, don't hesitate. And uh, I'm glad you guys are back, man. I dig the – I forgot to mention – I dig the new song quite a bit. Really like the singer. He's not quite midnight. He's a little more Jeff Tate to my ears. He has a, a real oh, Jeff yeah. Tate quality. Oh, that's cool. Well, that's nice of you to say. Which is not a bad thing, right? Not a bad thing at all. I hear a few little midnight things going on that he does. A little bit. He's got some similarities to midnight, but he's he's definitely got his own style, his own sound, his own voice. So it's nice to give somebody, you know, with a fresh sound, a chance to front the band right. rather than try to bring in somebody that's a real clone of, of mid or Todd or anybody. Last question. If you do an album and you get a deal and you, you get signed and you get some money to make a really cool album and, and are you guys, cause you guys are in your early sixties now. I mean, you and Dana and, and Jeff, I believe is Jeff 60 yet. Uh, I think Jeff is 61. Yeah, you guys are all right in that. Dana is as is, is well. I'm I'm 60, and I think Travis is around 50. Oh, he is? Okay, I thought he was maybe even younger than that. Um, if uh, you get this stuff, the right stuff falls into place, are you guys all in a place that you can do the touring thing, or is it going to be more like the touring, like let's do some festivals, do a couple dates here, maybe some fly-in dates or something like that, That more of that style? Yeah, probably more like that. I don't think we're going to be out touring for six months on in a, in a row. But, I mean, Crimson never really did that, even in the old days. We all – That's true. You know, we all sort of held, job, held down real, like, jobs at home or ran little personal businesses. And when we tour, we we do a few weeks at a time. We come home, we go back, we do a couple more weeks, some festivals. We'll probably do it that approach again. I mean, it makes you know? sense for yeah, it makes sense for guys like you that probably have either businesses or you work day jobs that you you can't take off for six or seven months. You know that kind of thing. It's not real practical to do that, especially if you're not going to make like 
shit tons of money that you can live off of. Right, right. So we might not be able to just all just completely make a living off this and just do it year round, but but at least it's it's nice that that we have enough of a legacy following for the name that upon returning to the scene, we're invited to play some really cool places. I mean, yeah, you know, festivals and stuff overseas where, where, you know, we get paid enough to, to make it possible to go over and do the gigs. Yeah. Stuff and, like, like keep it true. Did you ever play keep it true? We did. We headlined keep it true in 2011 with Todd. Yeah. That's like a killer thing for you guys that you probably would easily go back to headlining again yeah yeah we are i don't know if you knew but we are we're booked for keep it true october 5th this year oh, shit. That, no i didn't know that no <laughs> way so no we never talked about that but yes we we are we are the headlining band on uh keep it true rising festival which is wow. october 5th. october 5th in versburg germany um 2024 so that's got to be exciting huh we're already booked to do some some gigs in greece in uh march of 2025 oh wow man so festival that you saw the video of todd in yeah greece. yeah and yeah um we're, we're booked to play that festival again headlining headlining the one in greece yeah man Up dude to- this is awesome awesome news man in Germany uh, this October coming up, and then the following March we'll be over in Greece. Okay, okay. These, these are just the first couple things we have lined up. We're, we got some other things that are in the works. You're working on them. So the wheels are the wheels of the – We already have the- two headlining festival dates um, in the books awesome. that we're, pre- we're getting prepared for them right now. Was That, that wasn't in the press release before Christmas, was it? Um, I no, think, I, I don't think, think it was. I think we announced the keep it true thing on the same day, but a few hours later. Oh, then maybe I missed that. I'm surprised I missed that because no joke, man. When I'm not going to lie to you, when I saw the blabbermouth thing, I'm yeah. reading it. I'm like, wait, what? What? I'm like, I, I was like, man, maybe I'm dreaming. I need to wake up. Cause I don't think that's real. Crimson glory is back. Like what? <laughs> it's a nightmare for some, but no, it's a dream for most. <laughs> hey man, I, I will send you that poster for the Keep It True gig that we're doing, so you can see what a, you know the lineup looks like and everything. Killer band, man! Well, I'm excited for you guys, man. This is great, cool stuff, yeah. man. Yeah, we're excited too. When um, um, when you get a little bit closer to like um, some of that stuff happening later in the year, man, hit me up. Come back on, and we'll. We'll we'll pimp all that stuff out again, and maybe by that time, by October, there's a couple more songs, or maybe even oh, some yeah. record announcement to do. So there will be another single out definitely by then, and maybe even more uh, solid information about the full album and what what label we're going to be. Well, keep your boy and keep your boy in the loop here, please. I will. We'll keep in contact, and like you said, maybe some of the contacts you have or might be uh, something we might want to talk about as well. For sure, man. Uh, hang on one second. I'm going to sign off, and then I'll uh, just give me one second. Everybody, thanks for being here, man. This is super cool that uh, Ben gave up. He It's past his bedtime, so I got to get him out of here. <laughs> but uh, thank, thanks to Ben, everybody, and it catches up with this later. All of the information, CrimsonGlory.com. The tri- say it one more time. Tris Kadek. Triska Deca. Tr- Triska Deca. The video's down in the... Um, also, I think I have Dana's Instagram on there. Maybe your Facebook. I can't remember. Um, yeah. But I do want you to come back on at some point because we got to talk... We got to talk those things, dude. Yeah, for sure. We got to talk because I saw you posted. You have an Epiphone Les Paul and that's... I have an Epi... I have a... Cantrell, and I'll tell oh, you what, nice. I like this better than any actual Les Paul I've played. There you go. Nice. Hey, sometimes you get a nice Epi, and they're they're gems, you know. And it's way cheaper, a fuck ton cheaper. Yeah. So I, um, I, have a I have a gift from Les Paul too, but I got a couple of the Epiphone, like the Les Paul customs, and man, yeah. they're nice. They're really they're nice. Good. You still have your uh, Jacksons? 
Oh, I have about eight Jacksons. Yeah, I have some nice ones. Oh man, you got some original Randy Rhodes ones. Um, no, I have um like three soloist customs, um, okay. U.S. Customs from like the, the late eighties. Uh, I have like a couple of King V's, um, a Dinky. I think yeah, I just I have like seven or eight Jacksons. All with Floyd's on them, or yeah, okay. All of them, yeah, all of them have Floyd. I never had a Floyd, and I have it on this. Uh, some of them are set up for drop tuning. Some of them are set up for different tunings. I have oh, I have the. The, nice the caddy cat here. I like those. I love this body style, man. I think it's so cool. Sharp looking. I've always liked those Cadillacs. I just think they're just the coolest looking guitars ever. Um, I'm getting. Yeah. I'm still trying to get used to a Floyd as far as trying to dial it in perfectly because it's the licensed one. But I, I'm. I dig this one. It's really, really nice. So we'll have to do a gear night where we just nerd out on gear a little bit. So that'd be that'd be fun. So. Yeah. I don't have a crazy collection of guitars, maybe like 10 guitars. But, but no I more than me. I got five. So there. I got a Spectre bass. I have a Schecter bass, you know, so. Love the Spectre basses, man. They're awesome. Yeah. All right. I'm going to end the stream and then just hang on one second, all right? So thanks, yeah. everybody, who tuned in. Uh, 45 minutes from now, I'm going again for the third time tonight. Uh, we're doing the OG Metal Gems series tonight. We're talking Fields of Nephilim. We're talking Devastation out of Texas. We're talking Nasty Savage. Your boy's Nasty Savage. Um, and one other band, Blue Murder, John Sykes. So tune in in about 45 minutes. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. Go support these guys. Support these guys, all right?